Hello and welcome to the Judo Way of Life podcast. If you've been with us before, welcome back. And if this is your first time listening, thank you for joining us. Today, I'm talking with Australian national team coach and former Australian representative, Gavin Kelly. Gavin is a 14 times Australian senior national champion across six different weight groups, as well as being a four times Oceania champion and a bronze medalist at the 1990 Commonwealth Games. Gavin now coaches the Australian national team and runs the Queensland High Performance Hub. Morning, Gavin. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Morning, Dave. I'd just like to maybe start off with a bit of a background about yourself, how you got started in judo. and. Yep. Like most kids in Australia, you know, I did quite a few different sports when I was younger. My brother and I played quite a lot of sports and early part of my childhood I was spent Growing up in Wagga, which is a country or town, city, whatever, it's in the country anyway, country New South Wales. And most kids that grew up at that time, we just played sports. So we played, you know, like played soccer, I played rugby league, I played cricket, you know, all the normal things that kids do. And um, my dad was in the army, so we moved about a bit. And I got to a point where team sports weren't doing it for me anymore. I just, I didn't mind being involved in the team environment, but I wanted to do something for myself. So um, we moved back to Sydney when I was, um, I think I was 12 or 13, when we moved back 12, I think, 13, no, 13 when we moved back to Sydney and the local RSL club had judo on and I thought I'd give that a try. And from the moment I did my first lesson, I fell in love with it. What was it about the sport that you fell in love with? Well, I already... I guess I like the physicality of it. I like the um, one-on-one contest with someone else. I like challenging myself because, I, like I said, I played soccer for a bit and I played rugby leagues. So I like that physical, hard sport. I just like the um, idea of me, even at that early age, me matching myself against someone else. So how old were you when you first started judo? Started quite late, 13. And then how did the sport progress from there for you? Okay, so I was really lucky. I started judo at Ingleburn RSL. And when I started, the judo club had only been going about a month or two before I started. So the whole class was basically all beginners. And we were lucky we had three really um, good instructors, like not superstars of judo, but just good instructors who, because all the class was new, we didn't have the pressures of getting people to competitions and that. So we had an opportunity to learn judo properly. So I think I did judo for almost a year before I entered in my first competition. So it was really a great grounding. Like we'd spend a month on this technique and then a month on this technique. So I attribute that to my sort of later successes was that I was, I was taught properly from the start. And you speak of the, the latest successes. I wonder if you just talk me through yeah. some of those, please. Oh, okay. Um, well, as I said, I started judo quite late. So I didn't have the junior career that some of the current crop of stars we've got coming through had. So basically, I went to one junior nationals at 15. That was, I didn't do any well, but that's okay. It was all part of the learning experience. And then I, um, Went into young men's. I won the junior nationals once in young men's. I was lucky enough to get selected to go to Oceania Championships for when I was 17 for young men. At that time, believe it or not, I was under 78 kilos. And then I also went in the young men's open weight. And that year, I also came fifth in the senior nationals. So I was able to go as a the third rep in the men's. They thought they'd give this young fellow a chance and see how he went. And I guess from that moment on, I was hooked in on international judo. I was lucky enough to, as a senior athlete, win the nationals a number of times, quite a few. I'm, I was 14 times national champion in the men's over um, six different weight categories. I won the nationals a couple of times as a member of the New South Wales team when we used to have teams matches. I was able to win Oceana four times. We used to have it every two years, not every year like now. And I got a few other things. I 
I was a Commonwealth Games bronze medalist in 1990, which was the first year that judo was a full medal sport, like it had been in an 86, but only as a demonstration. 1990 was the full first time we had fully fledged medal sport. So I was lucky to get that opportunity. I've won US Open, I've won Swedish Open, I've won medals in Pacific Rim Championships. So I've, while I haven't had a stellar international career compared to some of the people around, for a kid that started judo 13 in Australia, a bit of a judo outpost, I'm pretty happy with what I was able to achieve in my time. Yeah, it's an amazing record. And do you think your lack of results or you know experience as a teenager, do you think that helped with your success as a senior? I actually do. I think because I started judo quite late, like at 13, and I'd done a number of sports, your ability to take on instruction and, and have a bit better idea of how your body moves, like there's something just said for little kids learning judo and learning as part of their movements, but as someone who'd done a lot of different sports as a kid, as a lot of Australian kids did, well, especially when I was growing up, I think that placed me well to do judo. And and also, I didn't feel burnt out. I've seen a lot of the national players, both as a teammate and as a coach now, some of them, like, they're in their early 20s and they almost look washed out and burnt out, you know. And I, I never had that feeling. I just... I kept competing internationally till I was, well, I retired from judo when I was 36, international judo, and then I had a few years coaching. I came back in my early 40s and fought for a couple more years as a heavyweight just because I loved it so much. I was um, competing as a 40-year-old. I'm assuming yeah. you're probably one of the oldest in the, the group at that age. Yes. <laughs> How did you find that? Did you find any problems? I or? had to adjust the way I changed. Like... I was still living in Sydney and I had a good talk with Joe Costanzo, who you know as well, who's my, was like one of my senpais when I was growing up and used to give me a touch up when I was a young fella, but it was all good. He helped me, um, come become a better player. And we had a talk about it and I was trying to train like I did when I was in my late twenties, early thirties. And he said, no, forget it. He said, all I want you to do is just be strong, get in the gym, be strong. And then. I just want like six or seven good quality randories out of you at each squad session and that's enough. And then just work on your timing and your chikomi and stuff and that's enough. And I found by taking that approach, I was able to have some success. Like I physically could not train like I was obviously when I was in my late 20s or even early 30s. So you need to adjust a bit. What I think is important, I had such a big judo base of so many years. Like I trained in Korea a lot. I trained in Japan. I spent a year training in Coventry of Neil Adams, you know, like I had a big judo base. So all I had to do is sharpen myself up. And in reality, any competition in the world, you can win by winning five fights. So you just have to set yourself for that sort of training. I just want to go back to something you mentioned too. And you won 14 national championships for Australia. And did you say it was over six different weight groups? Yes. Did you have a favorite weight group that you just felt the best at? Yes. Um, yeah, 90 kilos. And is that the, the weight you had most success at, or just the weight you sort of felt better in terms of how you trained? Like and- when I first started, like when I first won the national titles as a senior, I was 78 kilos. And, um, I had a really good year. I turned 21. My parents were very generous and they gave me some, a gift of sending me to Korea and Japan. So I went away for five months, three months in Korea in Yongin University and two months in Kokshikan University in Japan. And I came back and basically, you know, I felt like Superman when I came back to Australia. I sort of, people didn't want to train with me, which, you know, and looking back, I guess I was a little, difficult for them to train with and and aggressive. But to me, that was what I nurtured over the last, you know, the months leading up to that. And then I had a, went to the Commonwealth Games, picked up a medal there, came back, won everything really easily. And I had a fairly bad injury. I broke my leg and I broke it, end up subsequently breaking the same leg in the same place three times in a year, which led to having surgery in another 11 months off judo. 
And I tried to get back down to 78s, but my body had grown. I'd done a lot of weight, so I'd put on a lot of weight. I did get back down to 78 kilos, but it was killing me to do it. So like I was coming down from about 85, 86 kilos. So I went up to, after a few stubborn years of trying to force myself back down and not listening to the advice that I had from several senior people, I decided, okay, I'll give 86 kilos a crack, which as it was then, and and that like almost had immediate success. I won the nationals. I went over to Europe, had a couple of competitions, won Swedish Open there under 86 kilos, which at the time, and I think still now, is the first man from Australia to win a gold medal in Europe, which was a proud achievement of mine. And then a year or two later, 86 kilos changed to 90 kilos anyway. But I think that was my best natural fighting weight. I used to sit about between 93 and 94 kilos. So the weight cut was easy and I was really strong at that weight. And you mentioned when you came back from Japan and Korea that your your style was more aggressive. Yes. I mean, I've been to Japan and I, you know, I've trained there. I've never had the opportunity to go to Korea and train. Did you find much of a difference in the, the styles between the two countries? Yes. In Korea, like in Japan, it's really technically based and beautiful judo. And they spend a long time working on technique. They spend lots of time doing all the training and the training is hard and they got lots of body. In Korea, the judo is more physically based. Like they do have nice technique as well, but it's more physically based. The sessions are shorter. So like typical session, as you know, in Japan, Japanese university could be like three to four hours judo. In Korea, typical sessions about two and a half hours. It's a slight gymnastics warm up, then it's just a punch on for like two hours. And that when I went to Korea and Yongin University it was probably the hardest place in the world to go. Like I I spent three months there and for the whole first month I didn't throw anyone. I went a whole month of training six days a week without being able to throw anyone. But eventually by the time I end left the three months, I was holding my own, own with them. And um, then I went to Japan and I noticed the difference. So I had a immediate side-by-side comparison, if you like, what it was like in Japan and what it was like in Korea. And I thought at the time the Korean style of judo would probably suit Australian judo athletes better because it was a more physical style. And whereas Japan is very precise and very beautiful judo, Korea just has a way of using that physicality to make their techniques work, to force it through, which I think Japanese very unique in the way they do judo. And I I think we really struggle to do that, you know? Yeah. And what, obviously you talk about the physical, um, Mm. the physical side of the training and the technical side. Uh, What do you think that type of training did for your mental development, Uh, your mental toughness? Well, that's it. I mean, like it's not for everyone. I've seen in my time in Korea, I, when I was an athlete, I went to Korea for, uh, I think, six times, three months each time. So I spent a lot of time there and I saw a lot of different teams go and it's a place that can break people. I don't think it's for everyone, but it'll, if you want to test your, you know, intestinal fortitude and your, phys- and your mental resilience, that's a good place to go. Yes, from my, my personal experience, obviously, you say that the long sessions in Japan and you know, coming from Great Britain, uh, you know, sessions maybe an hour and a half, maybe two hours, yeah. depending on whether it's a squad session. But, you know, just going there and just being like, okay, well, you know, we've got to do four hours of training now. And, it, you know, just getting your head around that can sometimes, it's a bit of a challenge at first. Sure. And the thing is, what can happen in Japan, i found, is your mind can wander from the job. So you might be there for four hours. But are you really mentally switched on for the whole four hours? Probably not. No, uh, yeah, definitely by the end I was. <laughs> you, you start clock watching. Yeah. Um, yeah. Start dreaming of you when you're able to get some food again. Um, just like that, that exhaustion. Um, so let's talk about your, your transition into coaching. Um, how did you find that going from an athlete to coach? Challenging at first. Had to totally change the way I thought and. It depends on the team too. Like 
I went straight from being a, like a national team member to being a national team coach like within sort of six months. So many of the people in the national team I was coaching, I was formerly teammates with, which can be great if you've got a sort of, obviously because I was a bit older than them, some of them I had a bit of a sort of the old Kohai Senpai system working with them, but some it was difficult to establish that new sort of relationship and it was also different to see that other athletes may have had a different approach than what I had as an athlete. So it was challenging at first. It was, it's very rewarding. It's very, very mentally draining being a coach at an international event. Like when you go and fight for yourself, you only have to fight for yourself and that's it, your job's done. When you're a coach, you basically go through the fights for everyone. You get the draw. You try and work out a strategy for the people they're going to fight in the draw. You do some video analysis. Then you have to speak with the athletes about it if they want to speak about it. Some athletes don't want to speak about it. And then you, um, you know, when that person's finished, you've got another one and it's all that and you've got absolutely no control over what happens in the match. So it is challenging, but it is rewarding as well. Do you feel as though the, the experiences you had, you say, going to Korea so many times and training in Japan and all the training you did um, internationally, do you think that has a massive impact on how you coach now? Yes, and, and as a coach, I think I've learned a bit over the years too. Like in a coaching role, you learn how to do things a bit differently. Like one of the biggest challenges, I think, as a coach, especially in a sport like judo, as opposed to maybe like a team sport, You've got a whole bunch of individuals you have to coach and they all require a slightly different way of dealing with them. Some people, you know, like if they're not doing it, you can give them a bit of a bollocking and and they respond to that. And other people sort of have a bit of a sook and and you've lost them, you know. So you've got to really get to know the people you're working with and know what works for them. So that's another sort of challenge about coaching an individual sport like judo and especially in a country like Australia where we are a small sport and there might be one coach taking a whole team away of, you know, up to 10, 14 athletes, all of whom are different and all of whom you have to try and establish some sort of personal relationship with. And how do you think the way people train, do you, th- do you feel as though it differs now to when you were training, uh, like the attitudes and just the style of people, the way they train? Yes and no. I think that one of the challenges for a country like Australia, and it's probably similar in the UK and America and a few of those sort of, you know, advanced, more advanced societies, is kids don't get out and do what I did as a kid, you know. They don't go out and climb trees and fall down and play rough games in the school and all that. So for a sport like judo, that's a challenge. When we look at where some of our main competition is now, especially like a lot of the uh, Central Asian republics, you know, like uh, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, places like that, the kids still grow up like that rough. They still enjoy that physical thing. There seems to be in the Western democracies a bit of a um, thing where a lot of parents are shying away from letting their kids feel that suffering a little bit. Yeah, so I remember from. The same thing from the trips I went on. You know, we we go to Bremen, a judo competition in uh, in Germany. And if you didn't get to the lunchroom quick enough, like one of the teams from like Kazakhstan, one of the yeah. teams, they'd be in there and all the food would be gone. Yeah, exactly right. And they, they just got that bit more of a fight behind them. Yeah. In terms of just taking what they want. Um, yes. You know, I'm coming from the UK. Like you say, I mean, I grew up falling out of trees as well. I had that kind of, I was fortunate enough to have that kind of childhood. But you definitely saw a difference between some of the other teams that were there and, you know, just how they train. They always sort of on the attack, whether it was on the mat or, like you say, in the lunchroom. Yeah, that's right. And the thing is that I think sometimes we lose track of is that at the end of the day, international judo at its highest level is a fight. You need to impose your will on someone else. You need to fight for it. They're not going to give it to you. You've got to take it. And I think that a few of our kids start from a, a backward position for that. like, And it doesn't mean they can't learn that. It doesn't mean they can't, but it's not naturally in them. Do you think there's a way of developing that kind of attitude in kids that don't necessarily have it naturally? 
I think it comes from a lot of like the society we live in. It's so society is so in general risk adverse and not taking chances. But as you know yourself, as an athlete in any sport, but especially a sport like judo, like a fighting sport, you need to take chances. You know, like there's a great quote from a um, friend of mine who's a judo Olympian and is now like a sports scientist in America. Rady Ferguson, he's got a great quote on one of his websites saying, you know, before you wear the championship ring, you have to wear the suffering. And it's a great quote. And people, I think a lot of the kids and especially the parents of the kids, I think I don't even blame the kids. A lot of the parents of the kids don't want to see their kids suffer, but that what they're doing is they're stealing, they're stealing the chance of their kids learning resilience and res- learning to achieve something against adversity, which will serve them well in the rest of their life. Yeah, it's a strange concept because I don't have kids of my own, but I imagine you want to look after your kids um, and protect them from suffering. But unfortunately, it seems like that is uh, causing more harm than good in the long run. Well, could well be. You know, like in another 20, 30 years, when all these experts get together and they go, oh, why is this occurring? You know, like I think... There's a lot of kids, like young kids and teenagers and all that, they're suffering a lot of mental anxiety and and sort of problems there that didn't seem to be as prevalent as when I was a bit younger. And I put that down, and I'm not a psychologist by any means, but I put that down that they haven't learned resilience as children. We learn, and even as an athlete, you learn more, as they say, they learn more, you learn more from your fails than you do from your victories. And sometimes, we need to allow them to fail for them to grow. I'm highly biased because I was a bit of a soft kid growing up and obviously getting into judo did me the world of good because it was it was hard and you know you're getting thrown all the time and you know there's times I went home crying after a session um but thankfully my parents just kept taking me back and my coaches kept pushing me on and you know that sort of resilience it was well pretty much beaten into me. So that's what I mean Dave that's what I mean about the suffering, you know, you had to go through that suffering, but when you get through it, the end product is so is so much better and so more balanced an individual to deal with the challenges of life. Because let's face it, like, you know, judo is life. You know, if you can be successful in judo, judo is life, mate. All those things that you need to conquer to become half decent at judo, you need to conquer those things to be a success at life. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And do you have any trips coming up, coaching wise? Any international travel on the cards? Or yeah, we unfortunately we've been hammered a bit with the COVID worldwide <laughs> pandemic crisis, whatever you want to call it. Like when it first kicked off, I was actually overseas with the cadet team in Turkey. We had a big competition there, and we we're supposed to go to Croatia the next weekend. And we got through our training camp, and we we're due to leave on the Wednesday, and then sort of midnight on Tuesday night, just coming into Wednesday morning, it all got cancelled and we had to race back home before all the borders got shut down. So uh, when it gets going again, I don't know, hopefully soon. It's good, like it's, and it's affected not just international travel, like it's affected things in Australia. I also, I don't know if I've mentioned to you before, I also am enemy, one of the ambassadors for a charity up here called Fight for Balance which is a charity that helps youth, so young boys in particular, who are dealing with sort of a few sort of disabilities like cognitive and perceptual disabilities, you know, mild disabilities that sometimes go unnoticed. You look at these kids and they look perfectly okay, but they've got a few challenges. And one of the things we do is we introduce them, it's called Fight for Balance because we're, we're trying to get balance in their life. We're trying to help them have a more filling and interactive life with society. And we do that by doing boxing with them and doing judo with them, things that these kids have been told previously not to do. And that gets back to the resilience thing. Like these kids were told, oh, they shouldn't do that, they shouldn't do that. But we've been able to do some work with them and the results you see of these kids is amazing, you know, like it's really very, very rewarding work. No, excellent. So that's been a bit circumvented by COVID as well, which is probably harder for these kids to understand that too. Yeah, it's a bit of a tricky situation for everyone. And the the true impact isn't going to be seen for a number of years, I don't think. 
That's right. I think if we can take any positives out of it, maybe people will learn to realise through this what's really important to them. And what's what's really important is your health and your your mental well being, your physical well being, your you know, the well being of your family and that your loved ones. That's what's really important. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, so I guess one last thing I guess is I just touch on one of the things I'm doing in coaching now is as you're probably aware, I'm I've been contracted by Judo Australia to coach the hub, national hub in Queensland, where I'm living now. And that's an opportunity to go back really to the base level. Like I've got young kids there and we're looking sort of, you know, four to eight years ahead for who might become our next Olympians, you know, like so I guess I've got an opportunity to really put in place some of those things that I spoke about that I had when I first started judo. Even though these kids already do judo, I mean, we've got a chance now of them to get them really ready and really right and have natural, you know, a technical ability that exceeds what we're producing at the moment. And as I guess, as a closing thing, I've said it a few times to some of my friends that I was fortunate to have a fairly reasonable and long career, like I fought internationally for 20 years and had a little bit of success. But in reality, as a coach, my job now is to make sure that all those kids I coach are way better than me because if they're not better than what I was, then all I am is a show off and I'm not really coaching them at all. My job is to make them better than myself and all my other contemporaries were. That's we need to continue to improve these, the next generation. And I know you do a bit of work at your club as well. And that's, that's something that I'd tell anyone to be a coach. You need to think these, it's all about those kids you're coaching, all those young adults you're coaching. You need to help them become way better than you were. And that's how we'll be successful in Australian judo. Yeah. That was a really important lesson for coaches. And it's, like you say, sometimes you, some coaches don't necessarily uh, embody that sentiment. No. Mate, when I was... When unfortunately. Had, yeah. Unfortunately, in Australian judo, over the years, I've had some good coaches. I've had some ordinary coaches. I've had some coaches that used to be great fighters themselves, but they might not be great coaches because you always had the feeling like it was still about them, like they were the star. Well, you know, as a coach... I'm not the star. The star are the people I'm coaching. You know, it doesn't matter what I did or what I've done previously. What matters is what I help them to do. And I think a lot of the coaches miss that message. And I think it's important lesson from judo. If you go back to the original judo teachings of Jigoro Kano, like being humble is a really important thing. And I think some of the coaches, not just in this country, in lots of countries, and you see it all the time, they've forgotten that humility lesson in judo. Yeah, thank you for sharing that with us. That was, I think, a nice way to end the, the conversation. Yeah. Really important lesson to learn. And not just for coaches, like you say, for players as well. Um, yeah. Just being humble. Uh, I remember one point my coach took uh, me and my uh, <laughs> two of my training partners. Uh, we, we were getting slightly ahead of ourselves. They were like 18, 19. And he took us on one side and he's like, right, boys. He goes, I'd rather you lose every match you ever fight from now on but be good people mm. and win an Olympic gold medal and be an absolute shit. Yeah, exactly right, mate. So I was like, all right. And it sort of knocked us down a few pegs. And, you know, again, that was like, I don't know, near 15 years ago now. And it's something that still bounces around my head on a regular basis. Mate, the thing is, the great thing about a sport like judo is I don't care if you're the Olympic champion, sooner or later, someone's going to give you a touch-up. So... And if you walk around and bit up yourself and a bit of an arsehole, more people will actually enjoy that happening. You know, like I agree when you're fighting, you need to be aggressive. You need to be a little bit selfish. You need to take things for yourself whilst you're on the mat. But once you step off the mat, you also need to be a human fitting into society and helping those around you. You know, like you can be, it's sort of like a bit of a Jekyll and a Hyde role. And, you know, but unfortunately some people I only keep the nasty side and forget about the benefits of being a good citizen, a good human. Yeah. So we'll wrap it up there, Gav. That's all right. No worries, mate. No worries. Thanks for your talk. No, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to come and talk to us. And 
No, I really enjoyed that. No, it's good, mate. And I um I think you're doing a great job and I think it's good for people to get a few different perspectives of different judo people and their journeys. It's it's great. Yeah, well, everyone's, we've all got this shared point of we're all doing judo, but everyone's got a different story to tell and mm. how that's affected, you know, affected their lives. And even though there's quite a lot of similarities, there's still many, many differences. And, you know, you say, hopefully people listen to this and it resonates with someone. And Well, that's the thing, mate. I said, um, when I stopped competing judo, like I was lucky I didn't fall into depression like I've seen some of my friends do because all I did was channel the energy that I used in judo to other parts of my life. So... I finished my main part of my career in my late, mid to late 30s, had nothing. But, you know, here I am sort of 15 years down the track and I've got a nice house. I got married to, I'm very lucky, got a great wife, I have a nice house, I've got a good job and I'm happy in life. And that's because I put the same effort into life as I did in judo. So it's real learning for life. Yeah, no, fantastic. Cheers, Gav. All right, mate. Have a great day, Dave. Thanks for that. Thanks for chatting.